Okay, well, I think it's uh, time that we can get started. Um, my name is Dr. Schaefer. I was, was the visiting scientist, and um, it's my pleasure to introduce Karen Crow, who is the new visiting scientist. Um, but before I do, I just want to quickly go through the, uh, the etiquette script for uh, how we run the, the webinar. So uh, all audience participants are muted throughout the seminar. Please do not attempt to turn your video or audio to share screen during the talk. Um, there will be an opportunity for the audience to ask questions live at the end of the talk, just like a normal seminar. Uh, once the speaker has finished their talk, you can use the Zoom raise hand feature to notify the meeting host that you'd like to ask uh, the speaker a question. Um, the raise hand feature is located under the reactions tab at the bottom of the Zoom window. If you prefer, you may also submit your question through the chat during the seminar and we can read those uh, at the end that are addressed to uh, Dr. Crow uh, at the end of her talk. Um, you're also invited uh, to turn on your video during the question uh, portion of the talk as well. Um, okay, so it's, uh, with that said, it's a pleasure for me to uh, introduce our uh, speaker for today, Dr. Karen Crow, who is visiting from uh, San Francisco State University. Um, she's actually going to be taking over as your visiting scientist for the semester, this new academic year. Um, so Dr. Crow and I have known each other for quite a long time. Um, we were actually graduate students together at UC Santa Cruz. Um, before that, uh, she finished her undergraduate degree at Cal State Northridge. So she's a product of the CSU system. And then she went to Moss Landing for her master's thesis. So she's not unknown to Moss Landing. And then she uh, did her PhD with Giacomo Bernardi, who is a uh, population ecologist, uh, molecular ecologist, at UC Santa Cruz. And um, that was where uh, Karen did her uh, studies looking at population dynamics in um, some coastal fishes. And uh, I assume she's gonna be talking about that today. Um, and uh, she'll be talking about a, a variety of uh, some of her research to kind of give you a feeling for the kinds of things that she'll be doing today or at Moss Landing during her time there. So I'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to Dr. Crow. Welcome. Thanks, Scott. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here presenting the first seminar and kicking off my year as the visiting scientist at Moss Landing Marine Labs. As Scott said, I am a product of the CSU. I went to Moss Landing just like many of you did, which sort of launched my career. It was at, I was actually a junior high school teacher before going to Moss Landing. But uh, that's when I realized that I was in love with research and then went on to pursue a, a career in research. Um, so anyway, uh, thanks for coming to my talk. I'm excited to share aspects of my research and what I've been up to at San Francisco State with all of you. Okay, so research in my lab is focused on investigating the role of Hox genes in the evolution and development of body plan diversity in vertebrates, which are mostly fishes. We study a variety of taxa with interesting body plan features, including all those shown here. So things like uh, extremely elongated fins, elongated rostra, these beautiful plant-like dermal appendages, fused fins, and a variety of other um, re reproductive morphologies. But how could one family of genes be implicated in the evolution and development of so many diverse structures? I'll lead with the story. So I was a, a, a graduate student at UC Santa Cruz along with Scott Schaefer and Diana Steller um, when the first draft of the human genome came out. And one of the most interesting things that came out of that conference was that humans had far fewer than the 100,000 or more genes that they thought humans had 
based on the average gene size and the size of the human genome. At that time, they sort of thought humans might have 30,000 genes. And we now know they have less than 20,000 genes. So not only do humans have far fewer genes than previously thought, those 20,000 genes, all the other animals got them too. So that kind of leads us to the paradox of Evo Devo, which is if a diversity of species share homologous genes, then how does diversity evolve? The short answer to that question is changes in gene expression patterns, such as changes in timing, duration, place, changes in coding sequences, and or changes in the number or combination of genes in a particular path or network. So Hox genes have been widely implicated in playing a key role in the evolution of diversity and complexity because of their role in specifying axial patterning, positional identities, and novel features. Hox genes are a family of transcription factors that has been expanded by both gene and genome duplication. And they're sort of famous for specifying anterior posterior patterning during early embryogenesis. So Another amazing thing about Hox genes is that they exhibit what is known as collinearity, which means the order in which they occur on the chromosome is the order in which they are expressed in the organism, as shown here by the Hox cluster in an invertebrate and this fly larvae, or these four vertebrate Hox clusters and how these genes are expressed in a vertebrate embryo here shown by a mouse. So in vertebrates, the, uh, between the uh, invert and vertebrate split, there were two rounds of whole genome duplication, resulting in the Hox A, B, C, and D clusters. Um, and so this whole strategy of collinearity is what's known as the general Hox strategy or the Hox code. And it sets up segmental identities. So for example, oh, my screen just went black, hang on a second. See if I can forward this. So for example, <clears throat> during development of a representative vertebrate, in this case, I'm showing a zebrafish, you see that there are pharyngeal arches here, PA1, 2, 3, and 4. And they have these nested and overlapping Hox expression patterns, which specifies these segmental identities. So each one of these has literally like a zip code that says this region is going to be different from the other region. And in fact, if you were to knock down Hox expression in pharyngeal arch two, it would have a, this region in the zebrafish would have a homeotic transformation and resemble pharyngeal arch one. And so these homeotic transformations were how Hox genes got their name. Well, this is what happens in early embryogenesis. Later in development, my favorite Hox A and Hox D genes are redeployed in proximodistal features such as fins and limbs. Um, and other body plan adornments. So for example, here we see expression patterns of my favorite, my two favorite HOXA genes, HOXA11 in pink and HOXA13 in blue. In a representative lobe fin fish like us, or we call them tetrapods, and in two ray fin fishes represented here by zebrafish and paddlefish. So originally when people were comparing zebrafish and chick, they were like, oh, there's this special expression pattern. It must, it's so unique to tetrapods. This specifies the hand called the autopod. And this is very specific to tetrapods and, and humans and we're very special. Until they started looking at paddlefish and you can see here that the early expression pattern in paddlefish fin is quite remarkably similar to the expression pattern in the chick limb. And this is underappreciated in the literature. Um, So these, if we look at some other features then in the paddlefish, including the autopod or fin, the distal pectoral fin, the vent and the barbel, and we divide each of these into a proximal and a distal domain. You can see that each one of these has a distinct Hox code or like a zip code that specifies one region is going to be different from the other. And each one of these has morphological disparity. So for example, in the vent, there's a sphincter here that's not present here. In the barbel, there's taste buds ventrally here and here it's on both dorsal and ventral sides. So even though I'm only showing you four Hox genes here, this pattern suggests a model where independent regulation of multiple inputs um, increases the combinatorial, 
combinatorial power of the Hox code to pattern distinct features. And while all three of these features co-occur in a paddlefish, it's not hard to imagine that these zip codes could be redeployed in distinct lineages with different phenotypic outcomes. So with that in mind, today I'm gonna to focus on how the devil ray got its horns, the genetic basis of body plan remodeling in manta rays and their relatives. So here's a manta ray and here are some close relatives. Um, manta rays are actually gentle giants, but ancient mariners called them devil rays because they have these bizarre fleshy appendages stuck on their heads called cephalic lobes. And their relatives have the same things that are more closely uh, around their mouth here and here. So if we look at a phylogenetic tree of the cartilaginous fishes, you can see here that the sharks are the sister taxon of the batoids. Um, and the batoids, we have the skates, some guitar fishes and the stingrays. Today, I'm gonna to be showing you data from the little skate, which is in this clade right here, Leucoraja arenaceae, and from a cow nose ray, which is in this clade right here in the genus Rhinoptera. This is the clade of manta rays and their relatives. And Rhinoptera is the sister genus of Mobula. All the manta rays are in the genus Mobula. And together they form a family called the Myliobatitae, which are the manta rays and their relatives. And I'm gonna be specifically answering these questions. Are Hoxae 11 and Hoxae 13 involved in specification of the batoid body plan? How have the pectoral fins of the manta rays and their relatives been modified to accommodate a pelagic lifestyle? And are cephalic lobes independent novel appendages? So what I'm basically asking is, how do you go from a shark to a skate to a ray? To do that, we need to first look at the bones. So for example, here they're showing some clearance stain of these cartilaginous bony elements. How do you go from the triangular pectoral fin shape of a shark to this anteriorly elongated pectoral fin that expands forward and fuses to the rostrum? Or how do you go from these paddle-shaped pelvic fins here to the butterfly-shaped pelvic fins in the skates with this anterior region that's elongated into a feature we call the crura? Well, first you need to understand that fins and limbs are homologous structures that are supported by three primary cartilages called the proterygium in purple, the mesopterygium in green, and the metapterygium in yellow. Um, when people first looked at, compared say zebrafish and mice, it, this homology wasn't exactly apparent, but when you include uh, an ancestral jawed vertebrate like sharks, you can see that the, uh, the derived teleast ditched the yellow bit and the tetrapods like us ditch the purple and green bit, but these fins and limbs are homologous structures. And so here I'm showing you this arrangement in a shark. What does it look like in a batoid? So here in the skates and rays, they still have these same three elements with the proterygium, mesopterygium and metapterygium, but they're sort of fanned out with this anterior expansion. So because they're homolog homologous structures, Fins and limb begin development with the same conserved patterning program in all vertebrates with these two uh, organizing centers. In blue here, you can see the apical ectodermal ridge or the AER, which is specified by WENT3 and FGF expression. And here you see in pink, the ZPA or the zone of polarizing activity, which posteriorizes and is specified by genes like sonic hedgehog and my favorite Hawks D genes. The longer these organizing centers stay on, the more uh, opportunity it is for morphological disparity. The same thing happens in the little skate, but they have an additional AER in the anterior pectoral fin, which is associated with this anterior expansion of the pectoral fin. And this was discovered and described by Nakamura et al. as defined by this stripe of WENT3 expression and FGF. So here's where they show, this little purple stripe here is showing where the gene WENT3 is being expressed. And so they were able to demonstrate this novel AER that's associated with this anterior expansion of the pectoral fence. What my lab demonstrated is that Hox A13 is upstream of this AER and has the exact same expression pattern here as we see with WENT3. 
So here you're looking at a ventral view of a little skate embryo. This is the pectoral fin. And here's the pelvic fin right here. Hopefully you can see my cursor moving. And notice that you can see Hox A13 in this anterior pectoral fin, but you don't see any Hox A13 in the pelvic fin. Instead, we see Hox A11 expressed in the anterior pelvic fin and in some other places here, which I'll tell you about later, which also overlaps. It's a little hard to see because I copied this from a paper. There's also went three expression here in the anterior pelvic fit. And so we think this is associated, this is another novel AER as specified in this time by Hox A11 and went three. And we think this is associated with this distal elongation of the anterior pelvic fin in skates called the crura. And it turns out that the crura is associated with a novel mode of locomotion in the skates called walking or punting. So here you can see a clear nose skate. It's moving along the bottom. Its pectoral fins are relatively stiff and not moving, but it's, you can kind of see it's using those elongated crura on the pelvic fins to walk along the bottom. And in some cases, kind of punt like you see right there. Well, um, another novel AER had previously been described by Cohn and colleagues, and this is in the posterior pelvic fin this time of male cartilaginous fishes. So here I'm showing you a ventral view of a little skate. Here is that anteriorly expanded pectoral fin. Here's that butterfly shaped pelvic fin with the elongated crura in a female and in the male, they have all that, but they have these elongated structures called claspers. And so these guys were able to demonstrate that this is also associated with a novel AER as specified by FGF and my favorite Hox D genes. In my lab, we were able to demonstrate that Hox A13 and Hox A11 are also expressed in the developing clasper and specifies this region for something different to happen. And we only see this expression in males not in females of the little skate. So when we look at these three paired fin modifications in the little skate, each has a novel AER that's specified by Hox A13 in the anterior pectoral fin, Hox A11 in the anterior pelvic fin, and both Hox A11 and Hox A13 in claspers. There's also functional evidence to support these claims, and that is, if you expose embryos of the little skate to retinoic acid, which is known to disrupt Hox A expression, you lose, they, they expose three different levels of, of RA. You lose the anterior expansion of the pectoral fin, you lose the distally elongated crura, and you lose development of the claspers. So now I'm gonna come back to this bit where I showed you these, the Hox A11 also does some other interesting thing. There's, there were some other purple spots in those embryos. And so it occurred to us when we were looking at all this that these little stripes of Hox A11 expression are associated with the developing fin rays in the paired fins of the little skate. And so here you can see Hox A11 stripes uh, are proximal early and then they move more distally as you go on through development. When we count up these little purple stripes of Hox A11 expression and plot the number here on a developmental series in the little skate and look at the total number of fin rays as specified by Hox A11, the stripes of expression, even before these cartilaginous condensations of fin rays are fully developed. And then later in development, you can see each one of these cartilaginous condensations uh, that will become a fin ray. You can see that the number of stripes correlates with the number of fin rays. And in these adult um, skates, the number of fin rays varies between 60 and 70 total fin rays in the pectoral fin. So this actually was surprising and led to some really interesting insights that I could never have possibly foreseen. So for example, I told you that uh, here I'm just plotting along a developmental series as indicated by wingspan in the little skate, and I'm just plotting the number of fin rays. I told you the totals between, uh, this is during early development, uh, you know, as soon as you reach uh, uh, subadult, you the number of fin rays is between 60 and 70. But if you count up the number articulating with the front bit shown here in red, the middle bit shown in orange, and the back bit shown in blue, surprisingly, 
the number of fin rays in the front and back of the pectoral fin is about identical. And so this suggests that there's an additional plane of symmetry in skates where the number of the pectoral fin is actually symmetric with an equal number of fin rays in the front versus the back, which I'll tell you more about later. It turns out to be somewhat interesting. And this had never been described in the literature before. So, so far I've shown you that HOXA13 specifies a novel AER in the anterior pectoral fin of batoids, that HOXA11 specifies a novel AER in the anterior pelvic fin of skates, and that HOXA11 and A13, along with D12 and D13, specifies a, no a novel AER in claspers, developing claspers in male cartilaginous fishes, and that HOXA11 is associated with the developing fin rays in cartilaginous fishes. So, that has a lot to do with how you go from a shark morphology to a batoid mor morphology. Now let's talk a little bit more specifically about how you go from something like a skate to a derived morphology like this manta ray with these cephalic lobes that are functionally specified, specialized for feeding. And also their, their pectoral fins, which are also highly modified for a, a novel mode of swimming that they exhibit called oscillatory swimming. Notice that they have this expanded uh, aspect ratio and there's some other changes that I'll share with you. So these mobulids have been described as the only vertebrates with three sets of paired appendages because of these cephalic lobes that they use for feeding. But are they in fact novel independent appendages? Well, because we were in the business of counting up all these fin rays, um, I had an undergraduate in the lab uh, start counting fin rays and other batoids. And what we wanted to know was if these cephalic lobes are something new in evolution, something novel, are there extra bits in the front? Are there extra fin rays in the front? And so we started counting up uh, the number of fin rays articulating with the front bit and the back bit in a, in a large number of batoids, not just the little skate. And this is what we came up with. The answer was actually very surprising. So here I'm showing you the number of fin rays increasing to the right, and I'm showing you the number of fin rays on the front bit in red and the back bit in blue. And then we came up with a, a very simple metric that we call the FRINDEX, the index of fin ray distribution. So we basically just go the number in the back minus the number in the front uh, divided by the total so that it's a positive number. And so you can see here that the, the skates and some guitar fishes and many of the rays are actually um, very symmetric. So in other words, the, the red, the stuff in the front and the blue are very close to each other. For a number of these, there's a little bit of divergence in here and some of these have fewer elements in the back, but it's only in when you get to the myliobatids right here that you see the number in the front and back start to diverge. So the blue and red lines are getting farther apart. And interestingly, the number of elements increases here to the right, oops, Sorry about that. Increases. So not only are they getting farther apart, but there's more fin rays in the back. So there weren't more, more things in the front associated with the evolution of these cephalic lobes. Actually, the number of fin rays has been redistributed toward the posterior pectoral fin. So, and that's in our little uh, color code of the Frindex that's shown here in blue. So there's only one other family that exhibited this blue uh, Frindex. And these are the gymnurids, and it doesn't really show it in this figure, but these are not sister taxa, okay? These are not closest relatives. So what do these blue ones have in common? They're the only batoids that exhibit what we call oscillatory swimming or underwater flight. All the other um, skates and rays exhibit what we call undulatory swimming, where the pectoral fin forms a skirt and they sort of move along like this. I'll show you some videos in a second. Well, this figure, this complicated figure is what I came up with. And this is a message to all the students in the audience. Play with your data, find different ways to illustrate your data. So this is the scheme I came up with. This is the scheme that uh, my postdoc, Peter Hunt came up with. And it's so much more elegant, simple, intuitive. And what he simply did was he plotted the number of fin rays articulating with the front bit versus the number of fin rays articulating with the back bit. And what you can see is that the vast majority of skates and rays vary around symmetry as defined here by this gray dashed line. 
The only two that really deviate from this pattern are the dark blue myliobatids, the manta rays and their relatives, and the light blue gymnurids, the butterfly fishes, which are not closest relatives. And so now I'm gonna show you what I mean by this oscillatory swimming. So here you see a typical shark locomotion. They have this caudal fin propulsion. You can see that the pectoral fins here are fairly stiff, not moving much. <clears throat> and here we see a typical undulatory locomotion where they have this fluttering like a skirt. And these are the majority of the batoids uh, that have this symmetry. Here we show a bat right now. This is oscillatory swimming where you can see they have this underwater flight where they can move farther distances and they can sort of in, uh, move into the pelagic environment. So this is a bat ray. You can see these powerful downstrokes. So actually their pectoral fins are highly modified for this uh, novel and unique form of locomotion. And here you can see uh, what oscillatory swimming looks like in a manta ray. And it's pretty clear here their cephalic lobes are, are usually rolled and now they're unfurling to support feeding. And it's completely independent from their pectoral fins, which are involved in this underwater flight. So we started looking closer at the fin rays, at fin ray morphology, and we found that not only are the number of fin rays in the anterior pectoral fin fewer, they're also much thicker. And they have really interesting patterns of cross bracing that are different from other regions of the fin. So I know you can't really read this table, but what I'm showing here is a variety of characters in having to do with fins and fin rays. And I'm showing the ancestral character state in gray and the more, excuse me, the more derived character state in orange. And here I'm showing you in most of the skates and rays, they have the ancestral state. And here in gymnurids, they, they largely retain the ancestral state with a few uh, derived character states. And here we have the myliobatids, the fin rays in the pectoral fin and the cephalic lobes. Interestingly, the cephalic lobes, the fin rays in the cephalic lobes, they maintain the more ancestral characters, albeit with a novel muscle and tendon associated with moving those cephalic lobes. It's actually in the pectoral fins where the number of fin rays has been redistributed some are thicker, some have different patterns of cross bracing. And, and so these are the fin rays where there are the more derived character states. So if there's anything shiny and new about a manta ray, it's really been in the remodeling of the pectoral fins and in a different way and not so much having to do with the fin rays in the cephalic lobes. So have the pectoral fins of manta rays and their relatives been modified to accommodate a pelagic lifestyle? And are my favorite Hawks A and D genes involved? I've showed you that cephalic lobes maintain ancestral features, including flexibility for feeding. The pectoral fins are modified for oscillatory flight with fin rays being redistributed towards the back, which is associated with Hox A11 expression. And that the thickened fin rays in the anterior pectoral fin, along with thinner and more numerous fin rays in the posterior, contribute to increased lift and maneuverability. And this work was done by my student, my former student, Kayla Hall, who's now in a PhD program at University of Washington in Adam Summers lab. Um, okay. Um, finally, are cephalic lobes independent novel appendages? Do they develop independently? Do they share homology with anterior pectoral fins? And do they have independent posterior patterning via Hox D genes? Well, it turns out that all of the manta rays in the genus Mobula are threatened or vulnerable or near threatened, which are the two categories right next to endangered. And so mobula embryos are hard to come by. In fact, this uh, description of this one embryo was uh, its own publication. So it's, it was clear early on, we were not gonna study this in actual mobulid embryos. However, the Kaunos rays, which are in the sister genus to mobula are quite abundant. And so one of my graduate students was able to get on a fishing boat in Chesapeake Bay where they were fishing cow nose rays anyway. And he was able to get something that no one else in the world has. And that is a developmental series for any myliobatid. So he was able to publish this developmental staging scheme for cow nose rays. 
And one of the first things that we noticed was, you can see here that the cephalic lobes do not develop independently on the head or by the mouth. Here are some ventral views of a cow nose ray. You can see that the cephalic lobes are here by the mouth, right here. And, but, but they don't develop here by the mouth. They develop as the anterior pectoral fin. And so then we used RNA-seq to compare gene expression patterns from six different domains of the pectoral fins to see what the underlying uh, genetic repertoire is associated with this different fin morphology. And so what we did was we dissected the pectoral fin into these six different domains. And we also extracted all the RNA being expressed also from the pelvic fins. And so now I'm gonna show you which genes are expressed in these different domains. So there's six different pectoral fin domains. And here are six different figures showing genes that are upregulated in this first region of the cephalic lobe and the genes that we have in this section and so on. And so we sort of used these um, figures as a sanity check. One of the first things we found was that yes, TBX5, which is a pectoral fin marker, is expressed in pectoral fins and TBX4, which is a pelvic fin marker, is expressed in pelvic fins. We also found that exactly what we expected that posterior patterning by several of these Hox D genes is set up in the posterior region of the pectoral fin. We did not find any posterior Hox D patterning in the area of cephalic lobes, indicating that cephalic lobes are not independent appendages. We also uh, were able to validate that we have enriched Hox A expression uh, in this anterior pectoral fin, just like we saw in the little skate indicating this is specific to batoids and that anterior expression. But what we really wanted to get at was this comparative transcriptomics. So what's the difference between a skate and a ray then? So we wanted to mimic the study by Nakamura and colleagues who divided the little skate pectoral fin into these three domains. We did a very similar study on the cow nose ray, the sister taxon of manta rays. And we divided the pectoral fin into six domains, which we bioinformatically joined to mimic the Nakamura study into these same three domains. So it turns out that it's a little complicated to compare comparative transcriptomics between studies and between taxa. So if you look at this equation indicating that the expected number of counts is proportional to both the counting efficiency, which varies between studies and actual expression, we use this little trick described by Casey Dunn, where if you take a ratio of expression, say of the front to the middle or the front to the back, what happens is the, the thing that's variable, the counting efficiency cancels out and you're left with a ratio, a ratio of expression that is now comparable between studies. So here I'm showing you some volcano plots of gene expression with log fold change on the X and significance on the Y. And what I'm showing you here are that these fins are obviously homologous. We see all of our posterior patterning genes that are upregulated in the posterior region of the pectoral fin in both the little skate and in the cow nose ray. So these green dots and these green dots. I already showed you that a different way. We also found that the anterior patterning genes shown in orange are upregulated in the anterior region of the pectoral fin in both the cow nose ray and the little skate. But to answer our question, what's the difference between these two taxa? We looked for genes that were upregulated in the anterior region of the little, sorry, the cow nose ray embryo shown here in pink, but they were not significantly different in the little skate. Similarly, we looked for genes that were up in the little skate, but not significantly different in the cow nose ray. And this led us surprisingly, to a fairly short list of candidate genes that could be responsible for the differences in the pectoral fins between these two taxa. So we found four candidates that we like because each one of these in different ways interrupts that went patterning for um, outgrowth. And this is associated with this region in the fin that we call the notch or basically results in domain splitting. So splitting this front bit in uh, manta rays and their relatives into the cephalic lobe. And the rest, uh, the remaining pectoral fin has its own modifications. 
Interestingly enough, we also found another gene that's upregulated right here in the anterior pectoral fin that's associated with thickness of fin rays. And so we've already demonstrated that the fin rays here are quite different from the fin rays in the rest of the pectoral fin. So are cephalic lobes independent novel appendages? No, they are not. They are modified anterior pectoral fins. They develop as part of the anterior pectoral fins. They don't exhibit their own independent posterior patterning via Hox D expression, but they do have homologous expression patterns of the anterior patterning genes in both skates and rays. So then what is the genetic basis of pectoral fin remodeling in myeliobatids? We're already starting to validate with functional studies our short list of candidate genes that are known, went, and therefore AER antagonists. And we're pretty interested in looking at expression of OMD, which is associated with those fewer but thicker fin rays in the anterior pectoral fins. So there's one other thing that occurred to me during this study, and that is that cephalic lobes in the anterior pectoral fin and claspers in the posterior pelvic fin have a lot in common. They're almost like mirror images of each other. Both structures are rolled, they both have fin rays, and they develop by domain splitting. So it occurred to me that myeliobatids may have co-opted uh, an ancient pathway that evolved almost 200 million years earlier in cartilaginous fishes, because there's already a program running to split the domain of paired fins. So when we looked at the transcriptome of the pelvic fins, we compared three males and three females, and we came up with a list of basically clasper genes. And guess what? Several, here's a list of clasper genes that are upregulated in males, not in females. And a handful of those are also implicated during the development of cephalic lobes. So this is really interesting in terms of how um, morphological features may be manifest by co-opting co um, ancient genetic pathways. So this comparative transcriptomic work was done by my student, John Swenson, who's now in a PhD program at University of Massachusetts in Lisa Komorowski's lab. So distinct body plans and novel features can arise via subtle changes to existing developmental pathways, often associated with new modes of locomotion. So I've shown you some examples of the shift, the shift from caudal propulsion to pectoral uh, in the batoids, the elongated crura, which is used for punting in the skates, the shift from undulatory swimming in batoids to oscillatory in the myeliobatids, and giving you an example of how domain splitting delineates both claspers and cephalic lobes. So I hope I've shown you that there may be more to the Hox code than you thought. Um, and I think we might have to do away with phrases like the general Hox strategy or, or other things like that, because the majority of features that contribute to morphological disparity in, in animals and certainly in vertebrates develop late, whereas most research has been done on early developing features. So my lab is gonna continue to study how the devil ray got its horns how the seahorse and pipefish got a brood pouch to support male pregnancy, and how the surf perch got a modified anal fin to facilitate internal fertilization. So that concludes my little story about fin and ray. But I wanna spend a few minutes talking about some of the projects that we're currently doing in my lab. Um, I'll briefly talk about uh, manta ray populations around Oahu using eDNA. I'll tell you a quick story about how invasive mangroves in Hawaii has diminished habitat for an endemic shrimp goby pair. Um, how Hoxay 11 specifies other interesting features in blue banded gobies. And we've recently developed a behavioral assay on demonstrating that gobies are shy in the presence of predators. And we're interested in looking at if this, how this changes under conditions of ocean acidification. So um, there are well-known aggregations of manta rays off the west coast of Hawaii, Maui, and Kauai. But where do they go the rest of the time when they're not feeding at night? And where are they distributed around Honolulu, excuse me, around Oahu? Um, it's well known that these guys can migrate between islands, but they tend not to. And so they're, 
it's kind of a mystery of where they are distributed around Oahu. So we are currently, last month I was in Hawaii and we're taking DNA samples from seven different locations around the island of Oahu. Um, and we're using this technique called eDNA where we just take samples from the environment and we're able to detect if manta rays were there uh, recently and within a, a reasonable spatial scale. So it's relatively easy to do. It's um, non-invasive and has a number of other benefits. And so last month when I was in Hawaii, I was able to go on some manta ray dives. I'm just gonna switch to the end here. Um, and I used these, I was able to take some samples. Hopefully you can see the video. You can see all this plankton in the water that these manta rays are eating. I love this little water ballet here, this little circle. And so we were able to use these samples as our positive controls because we know mantas were at this site. Uh, we recently also published a story in Hawaii um, demonstrating that you know mangroves are good all over the world, but in Hawaii, they're invasive. And so we were able to show that um, Hawaiian mangroves produce unsuitable habitat for this endemic shrimp goby and goby pear. Um, and so there are implications for conservation of endemics. And so this is the back cover of Ciencias Marinas. These are my students in the water studying these um, shrimp and goby pears in Kaneohe Bay. And both of these studies that I just described to you, the eDNA study and the um, mangrove study came out of a field course that we launched at San Francisco State in 2019. Unfortunately, it was canceled in 2021, but we're gonna be offering it again in 2023. And Moss Landing students, you're invited to um, attend this field course if you're interested. Um, we are part of your consortium. The, the course has grad students and undergrads and a lot of good things came out of this, uh, this course in 2019. So we're really excited about doing that again in 2023. Meanwhile, I love this joke that I didn't get a PhD to study sphincters, but it turns out that that's what I do. This was another study that I published last year demonstrating that in blue banded gobies, they actually have a novel sphincter um, called the intestinal rectal sphincter that, that does not occur in madaka, zebrafish, stickleback, and so on. And it's actually specified by this little stripe of Hox A11 expression. So I'm interested in the evolution of novel features my favorite Hox genes are very often implicated. And yep, it turns out that I study sphincters. Um, finally, we've been looking at a, developing a behavioral assay in blue banded gobies. Here you can see there's some gobies here, here. This one's probably guarding some eggs in that tube. Here's another one, another one. And we've been able to demonstrate that gobies are shy when they smell a predator, which makes a lot of sense. So for example, there's a reduction in the total number of movements and the total number of feeding strikes when we add water from a tank that contains a predator. Um, in a different assay, we've seen that the number of seconds before their fir first movement goes way up when they smell a predator. So here in blue, I'm showing you the control. And here in the orange, purple, and yellow, I'm showing the titration of different amounts of water from the tank containing a predator. Whether it's seconds before the first movement or movements and feeding strikes, both of these are indicators that they're more shy when they smell a predator. And so what we'd like to do is rear blue banded gobies all the way to adulthood under OA conditions and see if this is similar. Most of the research has shown that uh, the effects of OA occur on fishes that have grown up in acidified conditions. When you just expose fishes to OA, you don't see as many things manifest. Or if you just expose them for a short period of time, whether it's in the larval stage or the adult stage, but fishes that have grown up under OA conditions tend to have these really important behavioral changes that are associated with mortality and predation. So with that, I'd like to thank the former members of my lab. And I, I actually don't remember, I hope I, that I showed the slide showing Shannon Berry, who's in a PhD program at um, Florida Institute of Technology in the lab of um, uh, Toby Daly Ingle. I don't remember showing that slide, but anyway, these are the students that have all moved on to PhD programs um, and of this published work that I shared with you. These are the current students in my lab that are working on some of these exciting projects. Um, and I should have mentioned, I'm actually looking for a student to, that might wanna get involved in that ocean acidification blue banded goby study. So these are my collaborators and my uh, sources of funding for the projects that I talked about today. Thank you so much for listening.
I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, great. Well, thanks. Uh, that was an excellent survey of uh, some of the things that uh, you're currently working on. I didn't, I, I thought, you, when you were a PhD student uh, in Giacomo's lab, it was, I thought it was more kind of population uh, genetics, uh, looking at some of the fish along the coast. So the Evo Devo stuff is really kind of more of a newer avenue, isn't it? Yeah, I totally went from, I, at Santa Cruz, I, I expanded the population to more of a study on speciation. And then in my postdoctoral lab at Yale University, I totally went down the road of Evo Devo. Okay, yeah, because I, I don't remember seeing any of that stuff before when you were at Santa Cruz. So it's great to see all that uh, uh, great work. So um, we can open it up for questions. Um, the easiest thing is to use the raise hand feature, if you would, and, uh, and then you can unmute yourself and uh, put your video on. And, uh, and then I'll take a look at the chat and see if there's anything in there. Any questions? I know it's, it's kind of a party foul to talk about genes, but. I, I'll ask a question first. Okay. Um, how, uh, how do you guys do all the, um, that cool staining that you guys, that you were showing? Uh, um, I mean, I'm not an Evo Devo person, so I, I'm probably, it's a naive question, but. Oh, nice, no, no, uh, I, I totally glossed over that, Scott. Thank you for asking that question. So I, I just mentioned on my, it's called in situ hybridization. And there's a variety of ways you can do it. But in our lab, we detect the RNA by, by building a reverse complementary RNA probe. And so um, basically you build that RNA probe and you, you have to use embryos with your gene of interest. And you uh, let the RNA fish through the embryo and it hybridizes with the actual RNA because it's reverse complemented and it will sort of light up in the cells that are expressing that gene. Okay, great. Yeah, it's, it's uh, such a beautiful uh, image. Okay, so it looks like uh, Amanda Kahn, who is a uh, faculty at Moss Landing has a question. So I'll open it up to her. You can unmute yourself. Um. Thank you. Oh, I'm visible too. Hi, Karen. Hi. That was so cool. Um, I feel like I have learned so much about like how and where the fins come from to get these really pancake shapes. And I'm trying to remember back to your first slides where you talked about the different hawks genes in different animals. And I'm trying to remember, and I can't remember, where do hawks A11 and hawks D13, the other ones that you were kind of seeing, where do those fall in terms of limb development in other animals and then in other fishes. So kind of, you know, is it also directing pelvic fin diversification? Um, the same one that does clasper diversification, is that doing something in the, the sort of pelvic fins of other fishes? Okay, so the general hawk strategy that sets up fins and limbs is the same in all vertebrates. So uh, vertebrates have fins and limbs, but I wanna point out that there is a Hox cluster in invertebrates and there's all kinds of interesting things. I know this is more interesting to you. There's all kinds of interesting things that happen. So for example, in vertebrates, the, Hox, the, the integrity of the Hox cluster, the order in which those genes appear is, is highly regulated. It doesn't vary very much. Um, but in invertebrates, like in flies, there is a, a break in the Hox cluster here. In tribolium, there's a break here. In sea urchins, which are actually more closely related to us, their hox clusters got a really weird rearrangement. In some worms, the hox cluster is broken up in different ways. And so it, there's actually really cool work on primary axis in animals and how the hox cluster is arranged. But your, your question about fins and limbs was basically about vertebrates. And so where are the fins and limbs? How do they start to develop the early proximal distal stuff? It's the same in all of them. The few, I'm interested, and there's tons of people who study that. And I will tell you, it's mostly tetrapod centric. You know, like I kind of alluded to this. Everyone's like, oh, the hand, the thumb is so different, which is so interesting because 
the thumb enables us to have tools and there's a Hawks D expression pattern that basically specifies how the thumb, which has fewer elements is different from the other digits. So this is like a huge story. And, and a lot of these stories are very tetrapod specific and how you know early on they were like, this must be specific to tetrapods, but I alluded to it. There's paper after paper that, that demonstrate that a lot of these expression patterns are actually far more ancestral. They map back to the, not just to the origin of bony fishes, but to the origin of jawed vertebrates, which includes the cartilaginous fishes, the ray fin fishes, and the lobe fin fishes. So then these little tweaks, they come very often at the distal end of something. Where is something different? Is it going to have cirri? Is it going to, you know, like I did this, I'll just tell you quickly. I actually started that study on paddlefish to study the rostrum. And I cut off the rostrum and sequenced the transcriptome thinking my favorite distal elongation genes must be there. They're not part of the rostrum story. But I had found um, HOXA11 and HOXA13 expression, which this was the basis of my first NSF grant because they are not supposed to be expressed anteriorly or anywhere anterior of the first pharyngeal arch. So I was like, hey, they're expressed. Well, after three years of investigating, they're expressed in the barbel, the little barbel. And there's really interesting patterns of the end of the barbel versus the whole barbel that lets those areas be different from each other. I forget if I said it, but the, the taste buds on a barbel are different at the end than on the ventral side. And this is how it's specified in paddlefish. This is gonna answer your question, but not in zebrafish. So, and this is consistent with what we already know that barbels have arisen multiple times inde independently in fishes. So paddlefish barbels, they have weird patterns that are specified by my two favorite genes. It turns out that zebrafish barbels are not patterned by Hoxae. Oh, wow. So wow. sorry if that was TMI, but it sort of no, no. goes to your question. <laughs> no, it was great. And actually, I don't see anybody raising their hand. So can I ask one more? Because you reminded me of something just through that, which was you mentioned these other, um, other forms of axis patterning. And you had mentioned Wnt, was it Wnt3? Uh, but a Wnt that was involved in that. And I'm mostly familiar with Wnt and invertebrates as being the sort of, you know, body axis polarity for the whole animal. So is Wnt involved in limb formation in things I don't study in the sort of the chordate realm? So Wnt and BMP gradients are certainly involved in this axis specification in all animals. And some of them have like an, a really neat inversion of that. That Hox A genes are upstream of all that. So basically Hox genes set up a zip code that say, we're gonna let this region do something different than that region. And the whole down, so, so Hox genes are not necessarily limb genes. Like they, they set up the patterning of the anterior posterior um, axis, like with the pharyngeal arches and the, the region in the brain, the rhombomeres, and then the somites and things like that. Okay. So they're not somite genes or fin and limb genes. They're zip codes that say, we're gonna let this region be different than that region. Oh, neat. The downstream stuff that unfolds. Right. Cool, cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, does anybody else have any other questions? Oh, looks like Scott Hamilton has a question. Hey, Karen. Hi, Scott. Yeah, sorry, we were, I caught the sort of the middle of the seminar because our marine ecology class ran a little bit late. We had 23 students speaking today about their proposal ideas. Um, but anyways, yeah, I thought it was really interesting, the story about, about the devil rays. So then, so then the comment I want to make, I'm really excited for you to come here and start working with us, because especially the, the work you're interested in doing with blue banded gobies and ocean acidification. So I just wanted to mention, maybe Diana's told you this before or not, but we had a student uh, a number of years ago in our subtitled ecology class that was interested in, in how black eye gobies would respond to predator odors. So it, we did a field study where he was swimming around, sort of squirting syringe fulls of different predator odor cues at the gobies and measuring kind of how far away they would they would swim. And then he looked at them sort of different days when there was upwelling or not, how the pH might modify that, you know, that, that signal. And so I'll have to look back at those findings, but you know, that kind of lines up with a lot of the stuff that you're, that you're interested in. And then uh, I have a current student, Laura, right, who's looking at ocean acidification, hypoxia effects and reproduction in black eye gobies. And there she has some real cool results recently. It looks like the low pH conditions, they're not getting fertilization. So I think there could be some cool ways to, yeah, just kind of work together on some of these things. For sure, for sure. Yeah. I actually just threw that in there to hopefully to stimulate conversation with you. And um, there's a student of Matt Edwards that we're working with, and you're probably familiar with some of that. 
Um, yeah, Darren, I know I've known him since he was an undergrad here working with us. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyway, I think there's lots of, of cool stuff that we could demonstrate and, and um, yeah, let's talk more about it. For sure. Okay, great. Does anybody else uh, have any other questions? 